Welcome to It's a Woman's World, a show which looks at any and all topics under the sun from a woman's point of view. Here's our host for today, Ali Nathani. Welcome to the show. In today's show, we're going to start off with a panel discussion about a book entitled Hitler's Furies. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce our panel. We have Bonnie Watkins, who is the former director of the Minnesota Women's Consortium, and of Hi, course, Ellie. a crew member here. Welcome. Thanks. And Dr. Susan Strauss, um, you are a consultant who, in the area of harassment and bullying. That's right. Hi, Ali. Hello. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. And we have Donita Kathy with us, and she is a business owner of Favorable Treats. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here. And Nava Johnson, she's a student, an artist, and the lead reporter for In Color Magazine. Welcome. Thank you. And of course, we have Dr. Ellen Kennedy, who is the director of World Without Genocide at William Mitchell College of Law. Thanks for having me. All right. So, first off, could you talk to me about, Ellen, could you talk to me about what is so shocking about the book called Hitler's Furies? This book that came out uh, very recently, Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, details what happened with ordinary German women, nurses, secretaries, wives, administrative women, and their role as being complicit in perpetrating issues of, or perpetrating acts of enormous depravity throughout primarily the Eastern Front during World War II. The book is shocking for many people to read on two counts. First, they don't think of women as doing these terrible things. And second, they certainly don't think of ordinary women as doing these things. I think most people know that there were some women who were brutal concentration camp guards and things like that, but they view them as being absolutely exceptional and extraordinary and, and vicious to the core. But this, this book is talking about ordinary women, women who were wives and mothers, whose husbands were the military uh, people, mm -hmm. and how these women in their roles were heinous in their complicity. Why do you think these stories were hidden, I don't want to say hidden, but they weren't as known as mm -hmm. other male mm -hmm. stories of abuse yeah. in the Hitler. I, I think in question. general, the focus is on the, the major perpetrators, mm -hmm. on uh, the people who headed up the Gestapo and people who headed up Auschwitz and the people who were really Hitler's henchmen in terms of propaganda and running the military and so on, those who were directly responsible for the crimes. These women were not directly responsible, mm. but their roles then uh, were such that those people at the top never could have done what they did without the support staff below them. I, I learned a lot from the book, uh, specifically to that question about the, you know, what happened after the war, the Nuremberg trials and so mm -hmm. on, and I was um, surprised how, um, well, first of all, how much the former Nazis were still in power. Absolutely. And, and not so much at Nuremberg, but in the, the smaller courts. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they explained there was something like, there was enormous pressure when they were assembling the Nuremberg trials and other criminal proceedings to narrow the numbers of people that they were going to be able to prosecute. So out of truly millions, they had to get that down to, you know, a manageable number. And then overlaid on, so, you know, again, mm -hmm. some of the people were so obvious. But um, then there was gender issues laid on top of that, that everybody assumed that women couldn't do this, or mm -hmm. they certainly weren't the planners of it, or they certainly weren't the ones who actually took out a gun and put them to people's heads, although it turns out they, they did. were. They did it. But they there were. was just that assumption that yeah, if right. they did anything, they were just kind of carried along on the tide. But the book makes it so obvious that there was, and I originally thought it was just a few, you know, truly psychopathic, yeah. sadistic women. But it is so, it, it was so much more than that, so. I think what struck me in reading that, having been a nurse and also having been a teacher, having been a mother, having been a wife, mm -hmm. I had the roles that many of those women yes. had. And yet they would stand on a patio with their gun and make it almost like a game mm -hmm. where they would shoot the Jews that were in their garden. And what really did it is when some of these women killed those children. I thought, oh my gosh, how can you, how can you do that? I just, I couldn't even fathom it. But I think that that leads us to a, to a question of, do we think that this could happen here? I mean, is there, is there 
enough, I don't know what the word is. I don't want to say evil. Is there fear? Is there, I don't know what there is, but is there enough of whatever brought those women, and actually the men as well, could we have that happen in the United States? We've had it happen. Yes. yes. With my response we to have them. indeed had it I happen. I think we have too. With the, the um, genocide of the Native American yes. people, with the ongoing persecution and racism of African American yes. people. Slavery, it's, yeah. Slavery. It's alive and well in mm -hmm. our culture. Mm -hmm. Because what we do is we dehumanize another mm -hmm. group. Yep. Mm -hmm. Whenever lives are, our lives are difficult or stressful or, or unable to be what we want them to be, it's so much easier for us to point a finger and say, you know, it's your fault. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and you are less than I am, mm -hmm. and I can act out against you for that reason. Mm -hmm. Well, and some of the women felt, too, that it was their duty, that Absolutely. they had to protect their country, and that somehow the yeah. Jews were, right. were less than and right. subhuman, and right. I, it was... Yeah. I was going to say, and some of the women saw it as a way of a new form of independence. Yes. So now they could be away from yes. home and like yes, that's right. be a nurse and to work and protect that's their right. people. And they called that's themselves, right. some of them called themselves activists. And I think of an activist as something very positive. I did not think of that as a positive activist. Well, it was new opportunities it for was. so many of these women. Yep. You know, I'm looking at Junita and thinking about what it takes to start a business, which might seem like a totally removed thing, but an opportunity for women to be more than, you know, the helpmate or the farm girl and all the obstacles they had to overcome, but here's this chance, let's all go out to the east, the new front. Right. Actually, I keep thinking about the American Indians and uh, yeah. that oh, whole, yes. you know, people didn't think they were doing genocide, but it was a survival, you know, in order for us, the white settlers, to survive, mm -hmm. we have to clear the land, those mm -hmm. people aren't using it correctly anyway, you know, and I, I think it was a very similar. As I kind of process the information, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, why, is it so shocking that women were so involved? Yeah. Um, that they could be so cruel. I mean, if you think about even taking it down to bullying in school mm -hmm. and a lot of time, or how mean girls can be to girls. And I'm thinking like how, why are we so shocked that, mm -hmm. and does it make it worse because women were so involved? Um, it just, I don't know. It, I don't understand why it was so covered. Because if you think about any movie or anything that um, tries to represent history for everyone to see, it's usually the men that are the perpetrators. They're the ones that um, are the thought-provoking people that come mm -hmm. up with the ideas. And women usually are the ones behind the scene right. doing all the good stuff. And you know, you, you hear about the good women that maybe provided shelter to whichever group was being mm -hmm. disenfranchised. But you don't really hear about the evil that happens with women, I think sometimes then we're taken aback right. or caught off guard because yes. it's always oh, a woman. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But there's something too. about the group mentality behind yes. all this, right? And the justification mm -hmm. of it. Because I, and I, I'm going to go with a thought I haven't baked fully, so be with me. But <laughs> w when we think of, I guess, even our own military, though, we, we, in situations where you're sending people to go and mm -hmm. fight, and the justification of killing is because it's fighting for yes. the right of the country, yes. right? Yeah. So uh, this thought is just coming to me that so, but but we we don't like killing. We, I think an average person might say that, right? But but in this scope, it, we say as a protection of our country, we may need to justify the killing by for protection. And yes. so I, and I think about these women, as you said, Susan, uh, you know, the mothers, it, it, children, and, and they shot children. But is, is that where their head was? Is, that, uh, is it along that point? Well, I think it relates in two ways to what Bonnie was saying. One of the driving features of, of the Third Reich, uh, a, a motivation for what Hitler was doing, was to gather living space for the, for the German people. It was called Lebensraum. And the effort to expand eastward and westward out of Germany was part of that, that focus. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're saying mm -hmm. about the westward movement in this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. And so, it's the new frontier where mm -hmm. things aren't very civilized. Mm -hmm. We'll bring civilization. <laughs> That's right. And oh. the whole psychology was, was shifted that everything was being done for the good of the country. Right. There was hyper-nationalism. And don't forget that Germany had come out of World War I absolutely devastated and decimated. Mm -hmm. And there was this nationalism that, that was really trying to inculcate a fervor about rebuilding the country and expanding it. Hitler talked about a thousand year Reich. Mm -hmm. and, and these young women were so vulnerable, most of them, that they really believed in this. 
and it was the opportunity for them, as, as was just said, to have new lives and to be part of their superior, belief in their superiority as Germans and as German women. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that came through in her analysis in the book was that the, um, um, this new, new country trying to put itself back together after World War I, there, it was confusing. There were so many people with different, you know, there were these gypsies, there were people with different mm -hmm. religions, there were blah, blah, blah. And the book really said, you know, there's maybe a human urge to simplify, you right. know, to turn the world right. into black and white, mm -hmm. good guys yeah. and bad mm -hmm. guys. So instead of having like, what's that all about? There's some Jew who's married to a non-Jew. Mm -hmm. Let's just lump the non-Jew in with, you know what I mean? It just, mm -hmm. that I think they really did think if they could possibly get rid of every single Jew and every Jewish work of art and every, mm -hmm. you know, that that would simplify things yes, and let so. them move forward as a people. And that's, you know, do we see that in America today? Yes, mm -hmm. I think we do. Well, you know, you raised an interesting point about um, uh, how, how do we incorporate the scholarship about women. And I think it's not that it's been buried, but it's simply that it takes a while for issues at this level mm -hmm. to get to be researched. And it's no accident that the author of this book is a woman scholar, Wendy Lauer. Mm -hmm. We know from uh, the development of women's studies programs that incorporating what has happened to women and hearing women's voices, whatever those voices might be saying, comes into a discipline sort of late and sort of on the periphery. And that certainly is what has happened with scholarship on the Holocaust for women as victims and as perpetrators. Mm -hmm. Some of the, and I, I believe there is sort of a women's culture even here and now that exists kind of side by side. There's stuff that, don't we all know men who just don't even know what we're talking about some of the time? Because women have a way of talking to each other. And I was struck by that in the, so they asked these women at Nuremberg and after, or the women who were never brought to trial, why did you do it? Mm -hmm. How could you, there were nurses who injected thousands and thousands yeah. of, of yes. you know, small children who were maybe developmentally delayed or had other things wrong with them. Yeah. Injected poison to kill them. You know, right? Some, one person to hold them down and one person to inject them, and these were registered nurses. But they said things like, it was a mercy. You yes, know, I did it to be kind nation, to them. Yeah. They were going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so justifying it with all these womany things. That's right. And another okay. another part of that justification was that Hitler had made it clear that they were lives unworthy of life. That this country was starving mm -hmm. between the two world wars, mm -hmm. and that these he, he called them useless eaters. Mm -hmm. They were not people who could help to defend and rebuild the country. And I think that the women, and and obviously the men, bought into that that demand for efforts to be put on rebuilding Germany at any cost. You were going to say something, Nava? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, geez. I was going to say also. I think a way that the women coped with it is because what you were saying, they weren't necessarily directly involved in it necessarily. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. because um, oh, I'm there because my husband or like mm -hmm. a lot of them, their husbands right. were in the camp as well. So using different ways to cope with doing the bad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And some of them tried to recant. So they would, the, in many cases, apparently, the husband and wife were both arrested. Mm -hmm. Apparently, in many cases, there plenty of opportunity to get their stories straight. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the wives would try to say they knew nothing, they had seen nothing. It must have been their husband who did it. Mm -hmm. Other times, they would confess and then later say, oh, I recanted because I only confessed in order to save my husband. I mean, there were so many yeah. games, some advised by mm. probably former Nazi lawyers. Sure, sure. Mm. Well, yeah. I'm sorry to say our discussion oh. has come to an end. Oh, no. But we could keep going. This is a great discussion. Mm. And I, I just wanted to say, um, Ellen, that if someone wanted to find out more information about World Without Genocide, do you have a website? Absolutely. Worldwithoutgenocide.org. Please visit us there. Learn about our advocacy initiatives, and uh, there's a great deal of historical information as well. Okay, wonderful. Well, I thank you all for thank engaging you. in this thank discussion. You. Good discussion.